Well, g'day, curd nerds. G'day, curd nerds. Well, 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 g'day, curd nerds, and welcome back to Ask the Cheese Man. This is where you can ask your home cheese making questions. And there's lots of people in the chat today. Before we start, I'm Gavin Weber, and I'm going to be trying my best to answer those questions that I just said. Uh, we are live on YouTube, uh, Facebook, and Twitch. And uh, yeah, you can find us there. Hopefully, there's somebody there somewhere. Anyway, lots of people saying g'day in the chat. Um, first cab off the rank today was Patrick. G'day, Patrick. Lovely to see you, mate. And Cease. G'day, Cease. Uh, who else we got? We got um, Patricia. Hello, Patricia. <clears throat> Over there in lovely Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada. Uh, Thomas or Tom. G'day, Tom. How are you, mate? Jeffrey and George. G'day. How are you both? Uh, Monique. Lovely to see you again, Monique. Annette, all the way up there in sunny Queensland. Hello, how are you? Hopefully uh, not too affected. Oh, you say you're not too affected. That's fantastic. Um, who else we got? We got uh, Stefan. Hello, how are you, Stefan? Uh, gone gliding. Lovely to see you. Bob and Barb. Uh, Scott, Bill, small fairy. Uh, how do you say that? Cummany. Come and eat. Yeah, that's, I think it's so, so. And Robert. Hello, Robert. Okay. Um, so let's say a few, a uh, bit of housekeeping. First of all, of course, as we always do, um, big uh, thank you to Chess. Oh, how do you say that? Cheese. Oh, I can't pronounce it probably. C H E S S V E. Thank you for your YouTube membership. And to Russell Parker, thank you for becoming a Patreon. Uh, thanks to everybody who's a patron and a YouTube member for supporting the show financially month on month. It really does help us um, keep the show going, Kim and I. Now, I'm not sure if Kim's online yet. She said she was going to be, uh, but we will have a look very soon. Um now, cheese video is coming up. I'm in post-production at the moment. I've got a cheese video that I made, not last weekend, the weekend before, I think. Uh, it's the largest cheese I've ever made, and it's a uh, Halda. And there were some challenges, let me tell you. So I've made it kind of like um, the video is not... Uh, it, I didn't do a cheese-making video about making... Uh, Gouda or Gouda specifically, I went about making a, these are the challenges that you may face when making a really big cheese. And that really big, it didn't turn out really big. <laughs> uh, normally my cheeses are about one point, uh, one, one kilo or, or roughly um, 2.2 pounds or uh, about 1.2 kilos using 10 litres of milk. Now, this one turned out at uh, 1.7 kilos, which is three point, oh, nearly 3.8 pounds, which is fairly big for me. Um, but, you know, there are cheeses that are much, much bigger than that, of course. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that's a really good. We'll get there. Okay. Um, uh, there will also be a Guido's taste test coming up very soon. That's ready to go. Uh, and Gorgonzola taste test. So I'm filming them soon. Now, I'm having a bit of trouble here by the looks of it. Um, not all of the chats are coming through um, uh, through to my console here. So, yeah, a bit weird. Um, let me just... Oh, I can't refresh that. That's not happening. Uh, does that help? No, that doesn't help. Um, let me just get out of that and get back. No. We're just checking things. See if we've got some communications. Hmm, not sure. 
Oh, there we go. That's come through. It's a little bit slow. Um, okay, so yes. All right, that's throwing me a little bit. I will, hopefully everything seems to be okay now. Um, so uh, somebody just said, it looks like I got a bit of sun. Bill said, I got a bit of sunburn on my nose. Uh, no, um, what happened is I have a new CPAP mask i have a cpap machine helps me sleep um and it was extra tight and i got a blister on my nose and that's the result so it's not sunburn nothing to be worried about uh it's just getting used to that and yeah not not happening um okay we seem to be having some issues with uh the comments so i can't show them on the screen so i'm just going to have to go to all places and Find them. Oh, there we go. Something's happening. The Facebook one seems to be working, but the YouTube connection seems to be broken because all the YouTube comments are coming in and it's not happening. Anyway, I'll I'll move along. I'm sure I can um, figure it all out. <clears throat> okay, so first question, if I can find it, is uh, from Steve. I think it's probably one before that, but anyway, uh, here is that question um steve says i see you using a sous vide now or precision cooker as they're called can you tell me the technique used to increasing the temperature um the cheeses that i've made with the precision cooker that i've had to increase the temperature so if you have a look at the guido's video you can see that uh and all i did was turn the temperature from the one it was on and then flicked it up to the um to the new one new the higher temperature and it took about the right amount of time uh to get to that temperature so that's all i had to do is flick the knob and the temperature went up so that was good okay um the next question is from uh, let's have a look uh from Elliot, I think. No, here it is. Right. Next question is from Beyond Blessed Organics. And I can't show it on the screen because I haven't got it. Didn't come across, unfortunately. Um, says, do you know how to extract calf rennet? Sorry, rennet from the calf. I'm a new homesteader, but if I ever need that option, I could have it. I can YouTube it, but would rather not lol um no i've never personally done it um i have seen some youtube videos on how they do it uh so they use the fourth stomach of the calf they dry salt the stomach wall um let it dry out and then they keep it in a glass jar and put water in it and then the renner enzyme chymosin and pepsin uh they leach into the water and they use a bit of the water there's actually a channel, um, this old lady that's uh, from, uh, where are they from? Uh, Kazakhstan or Azerbaijan um, that have been putting up some cheese making videos lately and they use the rennet bag. And you can see the little jar, you can see the stomach. Uh, not a pretty sight, but it seems to work okay. Thanks for your question. Um, next question is from... <clears throat> Uh, da, 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 let's have a look. Uh, Elliot says, any advice if you might be starting work as a local cheesemonger? Um, I, what I would do, I'm not a cheesemonger, so I don't know. What I would do, I'd go and taste all the cheeses. I, I'm sure they would let you do it. Um, in the uh, In the interest of serving your customers better, I'd go and taste every single cheese. Because then if a customer comes to you and asks for not only a specific cheese, but a specific flavor, at least then you'll know. That's what I do. Always test the product. How can the you know what, how to serve the customer if you don't know what the cheese is like? Um, also, you'll obviously have to pair up with somebody to learn how to uh, do the affinage part. Because a lot of the, the work that a cheesemonger does, they get the cheeses fresh from the artisan cheesemaker or the producer, and they mature the cheese. So the artisan producer just 
produces the cheese, uh, keeps it for a minimal time, but the cheesemonger themselves, they're the ones that do the affinage or the maturation of the cheese. So that's a, it's a big call. Okay. Um, let's have a look. Um, uh, Cracker Taruko says, do you have a favourite cheese? Mine is extra sharp cheddar. I love all the cheeses. I, I just do. Charlie, g'day, mate. How are you? Um, Small Fairy says, do you have any tips and tricks for an absolutely beginner tools? I think Kim's put a link up for you there, Small Fairy, around beginner's cheese list, uh, which is good. So that'll help. Um, da, 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 where else? Uh, Thomas has a question that says, do you recommend... Do you recommend often ripening at 85% relative humidity? Oh, sorry, no. You recommend often ripening at 85% relative humidity. Question, use a wet, wetted towel or allow the dripping way to do the humidifying. Does your advice change for the blue cheeses? No, not really, Thomas. Um, so, yeah, I do put the uh, moistened um, either paper towel or dishcloth, a clean one, one of those, you know, woven things. In Australia, they call them a chucks. So I don't know what they call them anywhere else. But, um, yeah, so you can um, just put that under the mat and that does keep the, the box at about 85% relative humidity and the any way that's dripping off the cheese during draining during that time as well. Uh, you'll find that... Um, it'll certainly uh, help um, raise the, the humidity. Uh, Kevin's got a question, says, uh, hey, Gavin, having trouble getting the pH down to uh, between 5 and 5.3 on all pasta filata cheeses, any suggestions on how to lower the pH? You may have to change the type of thermophilic culture that you're using, Kevin. pH changes with time, um, and sometimes it takes quite a long time if, if we're time. But, yeah, waiting. Uh, remember, the, the one of the versions of provolone that I made, uh, it took nearly 12 hours for the pH to come down. I left it in the uh, the kitchen fridge, covered the curds, curd mass, um, and the next morning it was ready to go. So... Uh, and then I remember another attempt that I made at uh, provolone that I may have uh, done the video about as well is that I actually had to wait till three in the morning for that one. So, yeah, it's pain in the bottom. Um, uh, Bill says, wow, I use a CPAP and I've never had, never has had that too bad. Yeah, it was a new silicon thing that really hurt. Uh, I had it too tight. It was just ridiculous. We've got a, a super chat, and this is from Thomas. Thank you very much, Thomas, for your super chat. Um, I can't even show it on the screen, but thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Um, Patricia says, Chucks in Australia equals J-cloth in North America. There you go. So a J-cloth, whatever that is. Okay, we've got a question from... Uh, Annette says, "More my gorgonzola should be ready around uh, 24th of April. However, it's already getting a little ammonia smell. Is that normal? Yes, it is. So just make sure that you um, the ammonia smell builds up as the penicillium rogue 40 uh, starts eating into the, the surface of the cheese, the fats. Uh, and protein. So make sure that you do turn it um, at least uh, once a week and, you know, wipe the box out and that'll get rid of the ammonia smell. So the what you can do to, to prevent all that from happening now, Annette, uh, 24th of April, what's that? About a month away, a month and a week. Um, what you could do is wrap the gorgonzola in foil, uh, so aluminium foil, um, and that way it won't off gas. So that's and then let it mature uh, normally. Okay, um, let's have a look. I do have a another question. Um, this one's from uh, Carmenin. Carmeni. 
It says, greetings, why does camembert taste so bitter? Uh, you're making it wrong if it tastes bitter. Uh, it means there's a lack of salt. So uh, you salt your cheese a little bit better. Um, so more, more salt. And then I'll stop it from tasting bitter. Okay, uh, next question is from... Um, uh, Bill says, on the sous vide, you can warm up uh, you can warm it up quicker by adding hot water. Indeed. So um, in the big Gouda video, which you'll see very soon, um, I had to do that. I couldn't move it from the stove top where I normally heat up, you know, 10, 8 litres of milk to the to the sink where I connect the precision cooker. Um, so, I, yeah, I had to start with hot water in the sink, that, uh, whatever came out of the hot water tap, and that heated the milk up. And then the hot water eventually cooled down and I got to the target temperature about the same time, which was good. And it wasn't, it milk didn't overheat. So that was a good thing. Um, Aaron says, how do I do a super chat? Aaron, you go to the YouTube channel and that's where you do super chats are on YouTube. So um, cheers, mate. Uh, we have a question from, oh, another question from Aaron. Looks like I'm only getting Facebook comments via Restream, which is the software I use to broadcast. Says, hey, Gavin, I made your kefili and about four days in the cheese cave, it started getting blue mold. I've washed it with brine and vinegar every two days since, and it's growing again after another two days. Any recommendations? I would love to keep something. Uh, keep, hang on, I would love to keep the natural rind. Yeah, you just keep washing it. Uh, it's only three weeks. Uh, kefili is well known because it's so moist. It'll grow the mold. Um, what I've done at about week two, um, I just stopped, stopped washing it because the mold's dry. It, it, it's like a powder, um, whether it be white or blue mold or what have you. It's not moist. The the, the rind of the kefili dries out really quickly because it's salted so much on the outside. So it forms a, a fairly hard rind to start with. So don't really wa worry about it. Instead of washing it off, if you find that it's just a powdery blue mold, just wipe it off with a soft cloth and you'll have no issues. If it's got no cracks or fissures in the rind, which it shouldn't do, uh, the blue won't get into the cheese and you'll get that lovely kefili flavour. Okay. Um, next question is... Uh, I can't translate the Arabic name, but um, it says, I have microbial rennet from the uh, Valley Ren brand. Uh, one gram is enough for 10 litres... Uh, sorry, 100 litres of milk. And this is a lot. Can I put the powder in any chemical liquid or water to turn it into liquid rennet? Now, I haven't seen that used. Um, and I don't think it would store very well anyway. Uh, but when you do use powdered rennet, um, you always put it in some water to dilute it first. You, don't, so just, you just don't put the powder into the milk and sit it on top like you would a direct, direct vac... Uh, direct vat inoculated starter culture so you will have to dilute it with water but you should use it within you know 20 20 minutes to an hour of mixing it because it starts to lose its potential so um so you can't make a liquid rennet and then store it you have to just make it and then use it so one gram yeah so you're going to have to use one tenth of a gram for 10 liters of milk is what I can figure out there anyway. So you would have to get a scale, a mini scale, which I actually have in our store. We have a, a, a micro scale for measuring out cultures if you so desire. Um, I don't know if it's available where you are, um, but you can get them uh, on eBay for a little bit more. Anyway, uh, next question is from, and I'm sorry if I've missed any because I'm a little bit confused today. Uh, Patrick said, Gavin, is there any cheese that you don't like? Um, cheeses that are really overripe and smell foul, but that's more on the rotten side. <laughs> don't eat rotten cheese. Um, I would never touch the uh, Sicilian, che Sicilian cheese, uh, Casu Marzu, the one with maggots in it. Not even a fan. So I don't know why everybody asks whether I'm going to make it or not. I think it's just for shits and giggles. Um Anyway, Patrick says, Gav, the new owners of Cheese Needs now have, now have Manchego molds 
at really great prices if you are still looking for one. Yeah, so Tracy over at cheeseneeds.com, um, who also run the Learn to Make Cheese Facebook group, um yeah she has offered me one i haven't taken her up on the offer but they they do look really good um and i probably will end up getting one of those anyway but thanks kevin appreciate it um i don't know where she gets them from uh, but here in australia very hard to get um all right let's have a look what's the next comment yeah um Marcia says, is the determined temperature to cook the curds very important? If you overshoot by one to two degrees, is the cheese ruined? No, it's not. There's there's enough flexibil flexibility in most cheese making recipes that if you overshoot by, if you're talking about one to two degrees Celsius, yeah, it'll be okay. One to two degrees Fahrenheit, it's nothing. Um, no, your cheese won't be ruined. If you overshoot it by 10 to 15 degrees, then yes, there's going to be a major issue, especially if you're using, say, a mesophilic uh, starter culture that only really has a tolerance up to about 38, 39 degrees Celsius. After that, it starts to kill the lactic bacteria, the temperature. So if you're using a mesophile and you overshoot it over by, you know, 10, 15 degrees, then I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even finish that cheese off. Okay. Um, next question is from uh, Kristen, and Kristen says, I recently added a uh, smoked bacon salt to a cheese, haven't tasted it. Do you think the cheese will have a smoked taste? Uh, love your channel. My dog loves you too. <laughs> He's my taste tester. Thank you, uh, Kristen. Uh, I'm not sure. Now, some of those bacon salts, those smoked bacon salts have uh, sodium nitrate um in them so that may impart a flavor that probably you're not used to in cheese but you never know uh yeah it may have the smoky flavor i'm not sure but uh yeah hey you're gonna taste test it and send me a photo of course um in the gallery and that will oh, and tell me how good it was all right, um, Three Voyages Homestead says, Hi, Gavin and Kim, uh, you have used the culture Flav 54. Oh, have you used the culture Flav 54? Uh, does it prevent bitterness? And what are your thoughts on it as well? As do you reduce the other cultures when using this? I've never used it. Um, so I have no comment. Don't know. Uh, don't have any experience with it. Sorry about that. <clears throat> um steve steven says what cultures do you recommend cheeses cheesemakers have on hand for those uh without a cheese cave so um as kim put up the link earlier um let's have a look uh i would get an aromatic mesophilic culture like something like flora danica That'll be in my bag of tricks if you don't have a cheese fridge, because with that, you can make so many different soft cheeses. Um, so just about every soft cheese, even even white molded cheeses, but you need a, a fridge for that. Um, what else? Um, probably a, mesoph a, a, mes a, a basic mesophilic with the two lactic bacteria in them, um, Lactobacillus lactus subspecies lactus and Lactobacillus lactus subspecies cremoris. You'll need that, um, that basic uh, mesophilic culture for some soft cheeses. Quick ones like um, queso fresco is a, is a good example, which is a, a firm, firm-ish fresh cheese, which you can make without a cheese cave. And you can also use that for... Um, um, uh sorry there's a super chat going on that's confused me i'll just stop that thank you ruth appreciate the 20 dollars. i'll get to your question in a second um so um where, where where was i sorry i've lost it today i'm out of practice aren't i um yeah so and and i would get a thermophilic starter culture just an st so what, what's it called thermo b which is ST and Lactobacillus lactis subspecies bulgaris. Um, get that um, 
that thermophilic culture so you can make something like uh, bel paese, which is a beautiful cheese that are made just in the fridge. So we'll get to the, uh, the super chat, which I can't show on the screen because it's all broken. Ruth has uh, kindly donated $20 US. Thank you, Ruth. Appreciate it. it. says, hi, Gavin and Kim and all the world's curd nerds. I'm late. No, you're not, Ruth. Two questions. I'm waiting for uh, Patricia Patricia's Nova Scotia Fog. When? Cool question. It's on my list to make for next weekend. Um, and why would Way end up with a lot of milk solids? Uh, thanks, love from San Francisco, Western Australia. Um, Western Australia, <laughs> United States. Well, uh, where did I get that from? Um, why would you end up a lot of milk solids? Um, you, sometimes it's when not using enough rennet. It doesn't set all of the uh, the proteins within the milk and you get a very, very cloudy way. I've also noticed that when using sheep's milk uh, and sometimes goat's milk, um, Ruth, that it uh, doesn't matter how much rennet, there's always milk solids left behind and you get a fantastic uh, whey ricotta out of it. Um, and also when there's... Let me have a look. Uh, it's either it's at the end of the lactation period of the animal. Uh, you will also find there's not enough proteins in there to help set the cheese, and you'll get a lot of the calcium in the way, so it looks cloudy. So I hope that answers your question. Um, uh, da -da. Um, Bill says, for your info, my comments are all coming from YouTube. Indeed, they are. It's just the software that I'm using, Bill. I use this product called Restream. It's never let me down before, but today it has. All the comments from YouTube aren't coming across into my consolidated chat box that I can show from YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. I can't see them. So I can't see the YouTube ones. So I'm having to go onto the YouTube tool that they give you natively and read them off of there so yeah it's all working it's just not working for me so anyway uh, moving right along um seth says hello gavin hope all is well yes seth uh, indeed it is and thank you for your photos this morning uh, i managed to sneak them into the gallery uh which uh in three minutes we'll be showing Patricia says, hey, curd nerds, I sincerely endorse Gavin's micro mini scales. Yes, I think Patricia has got one. I sent one over to her. Uh, she bought it, of course. <laughs> All right. Um, next question is from uh, Donna. Donna says, tried Munster twice and failed. Is there any way to test viable cultures prior? Um, yeah, you could, um, I would get some, uh, warm milk, um, and add a little bit of starter cold, sorry, get a bit of warm milk, test the pH. So you'll have, this is a pH thing, test the pH to start with. It should be about 6.8 to 6.6. .6. Um, if it's raw milk and it's been left there for a while, it starts to acidify quicker, but it should be about 6.8. Add your starter culture, uh, wait for an hour or two. To, and this is only like a cup of milk. That's all I'm talking about, 250 milliliters. Um, add your starter culture to it at about, oh, well, 132nd of a teaspoon. So what's that? A drop? No, a pinch. A pinch, I think, using little mini measuring spoons. Add a little bit of that. Um and uh, thank you for the super chat, whoever that was. I'll get to that in a second. Um, and then let it acidify for about two hours. Test the pH again. It should have dropped uh, down to about 6.2, roughly, uh, over that period of uh, one to two hours. And then you'll know your starter cultures are actually working. So that's one way to test them. Hopefully that helps you, Donna. Okay. Uh, Seth says... Uh, what if you overheat cheese and then cool it back off? Um, if you heat, overheat the milk and let it cool back, that's fine. And then add the starter cultures at the right temperature. If you've overheated the cheese, oh, that's time for the gallery. I'll get to that in a sec. If you overheat the cheese, 
and let it cool back, damage is done. Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, Aaron says, hey, Gavin, have you ever been to the United States where? Uh, yes, I have. I've been to the island state of Hawaii uh, when I was in the Navy seven times. Um, lovely place. But mainland USA, no, I haven't been there. Okay. Um, so, sorry, that super chat was from Kristen. And thank you, Kristen, for the $20. Doesn't have a anything down the bottom to a no comment, but thank you so much for the $20 US. Let's get to the super chat. Uh, not super chat, the gallery. Hopefully this works. Hopefully my software is not totally stuffed up. Um, okay. Um, no, it's, that's not working. Let's bring that up. Oh, might be working. Hey, there we go. All right. It's all happening now. There's another super chat going off in the background. Um, who's that from? That's from Aaron. Thank you, Aaron McRae, for your $4.99 US. Appreciate it. Anyway, we'll get to the... Uh, let's have a look at the gallery and see how cool it is today. All right. So this is from Cup of Tea Love. Now, what did... Um, have I got that up? Where the heck is everything? Today is so confusing. <laughs> oh, goodness me. Right, so a cup of tea love. This is a cream cheese. A cup of tea love made. And it says, you can add cream cheese to the list of things that work with lactose-free milk. There you go. It was very tangy, not unpleasantly so, but definitely at the upper limit. I think I've only ever made normal cream cheese once and it was a very long time ago. So I don't remember enough to compare them, sadly. So it looks pretty good on a bagel. So I think just using my normal cream cheese recipe. Uh, Kim, if you're in the chat there somewhere, if you can go and dig that up, the cream cheese recipe, and just use lactose-free milk instead. It should work. It should work. <laughs> All right, so the next uh, photo is from uh, Habib, and Habib has some stuff going on here. Where is it? Habib says, uh, so this is a picture of his cloth-bound cheddar uh, in his ripening container. It says, hi, Gavin, I was wondering if I want to vacuum my three-month-old traditional cloth-bound cheddar. Should I remove the cloth before vacuuming, or should I simply brush the mold bacteria covering the whole cheese and vacuum the cheese in place. I'm afraid that if I keep the cloth on, I'll be causing off flavors to be incorporated into the cheese due to the vacuum. My vacuuming aim is to stop spreading various molds into my cave to lessen my maintenance and to keep mites from getting into it. Um, I'm sending you a second photo. All right, hang on. Uh... That's the second photo or third photo. Um, showing my whole cheese with my hand with my ring underneath to have an idea of the real size of it. Thank you, Habib. Um, look, personally, I just keep it in a ripening container with um, and keep the lid slightly ajar off it so the humidity doesn't build up too much. And just keep dry, uh, you know, with a dry cloth, just um, brush it off, brush off that mold. And I do that probably once a week, but it probably wouldn't need it once a week. You could vacuum pack it. I couldn't see there being an issue. I would not take off the cloth banding because currently the cloth banding is acting acting like uh, cheese wax. And it's keeping the molds on the outside of the cloth, not on the inside. I don't think it would matter too much as long as the surface was dry and you've just dry brushed off the mold. Uh, I don't think there'd be any issues really. Uh, by vacuum packing, I don't think you'll have an infusion of any of the mold flavors into the cheese. I think it'll be fine. So thanks for your question and thanks for your photos, Habib. That was really good, something different. Uh, this one is from Lindsay, and this is a, uh, he's just called it his blue cheese. Where is it? Lindsay says, hi, Gavin. I hope you had a lovely, relaxing uh, break for your anniversary. Here are some pictures of my latest creation. I think the red mold got to the rind, but it's not overpowering the cheese at all. Some surface ripening of Brevibacteria linens adds to the overall impression of this cheese. It's now seven weeks old. So I think he cut into it. Let's have a look. That looks special. 
Very nice. So you've got the inside ripening in the Penicillium Rogue 40, the blue mould, blue-green mould. And he's got a little bit of the the outside has um, been infected by the red mould, Brevia bacteria linens. I think that's okay. It looks great. I would eat that in a heartbeat. So well done, Lindsay. Appreciate you sending in your photo to the gallery. Oh, and there's another view of Lindsay's cheese. Very nice indeed. Okay, this is from Seth, who snuck in his um, uh, snuck in his cheese at the very end. Let's go. We got a got a comment about it here. It says um, this one is a boars or eyeballs. It's a was that from Spain? Yep. I had sent you a photo of this cheese as it was ripening. I've now opened it at two months. It was heavily coated with smoked paprika slash olive oil, which I scraped off. The finished product is quite delicious, but it does not have the quite the amount of smoked flavor I had hoped for with the surface rub, and I was quite generous with the rub. I may experiment with some other time adding liquid smoke to cheese. Nonetheless, both myself and my neighbours will be quite pleased with the outcome. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, I've added um, uh, liquid smoke that you get for barbecuing, and I added that to uh, a gouda, I think, and there was a slight smoky flavour to the cheese, not overly smoky like you would get. Um, you know, you can buy those some of those Dutch processed cheeses that say smoked cheese. Um and they got a little brown rind on the outside. Yeah, it's um, it was slightly like that. Anyway, so this is another one. This is a Stilton from Seth. And uh, this is a Stilton Blue from a few weeks ago that I had sent you a photo of. The recipe called for three months of ripening, but the three-month mark, it is very strong. Indeed. Um, delicious, but sharp, even with the blue scraped off the surface. Um, I had created several smaller cheeses rather than the large one that the recipe specifies. I learn more about this craft each and every time I make a cheese and your channel is like the Holy Grail. Thanks so much for your dedication. Thank you, Seth. I think you would find that it wouldn't be as strong if you had made the larger cheese. Uh, so you're yeah, making smaller ones of that recipe. You get a deeper depth of flavor. Um, as I found when I made the Petite blue cheeses. Um, so, yeah. All righty. Um, let's, what else we got? Oh, okay. So here's some gallery photos, not specifically cheese. This is Kim and uh, my time away. So this is the first place we went to. We went to two places for our anniversary. So this is called Mutan. This is in the little town of Trentham in, uh, in Victoria. It's only about an hour away from us. Um, so that was a little, um, it was a house, it wasn't little. Um, uh, and it had some beautiful gardens. And here's a picture of me and the doggos um, walking through the, it was like a little, uh, the garden was beautiful. So we're in this little grotto type thing. And uh, yeah, that's Kim taking an unaware shot of me. And there's the doggos in some flowers. Um, Hamish is, which one's Hamish? Uh, oh, Bonnie, Hamish is on the left and Bonnie's on the right. Yeah, I can tell because we gave Bonnie a haircut before we left and a, and a wash oh, and Hamish. The second time away um, was on our actual anniversary day. And um, yeah, that we went to a place called um, Lance Moore Werribee Mansion Hotel. Uh, so this is the, it used to be an old um, seminary where they taught priests how to be priests um but it was converted into a hotel many years back it is uh an amazing place great it's only about an hour's drive from us where we live but it was gorgeous um so there's a picture of us um on our anniversary uh me and kim looking stunning as always uh there she is beautiful woman um don't blush honey you look gorgeous and you always will in my heart <laughs> Lovely. Um, well, uh, there's me uh, finishing off our nightcap. That's a, a, a lovely glass of tawny port, which I'm quite partial to, just one uh, as a nightcap at the end of the night. Uh, there's the room we stayed in. Very nice, comfortable. King-size bed was a bit too much. 
It was, it was like we were lost. It was just way too big. Anyway, uh, and a complimentary bottle of red wine, Shiraz wine. Uh, it was very nice. Anyway, so that was our trip away. Hope you enjoyed those holiday snaps. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, as Patricia said before. <laughs> oh, lovely. All righty. So thank you, everybody, for sending in um, your gallery photos. How do you do it uh, is what you're probably asking. Nick. How do I send in my cheese photos to Gav to show on the weekly live stream? Well, let me show you uh, if it works. Uh, here we go. So you go to Gav's YouTube channel that you're all watching or not if you're on Facebook or Twitch, but you go to the YouTube channel and you go to the About tab. Can you see my little pointer? Yes, you can. There it is. You go there and then you go down here to Details and it says, for business inquiry, sign in to see email address, sign in with your YouTube account, or if you're signed in already, you'll see something you have to do a capture and you get a you get the email address. Send your photo, gallery photos there. Um, even if it's a disaster, send that in with a question and I'll answer it like I did Habib's today. But lo I love cheese photos. Send them in. And if it's good enough and you've done a good job with your photo, I'll use it as a thumbnail like I have with Lindy's, Lindsay's blue cheese for today's episode. So, yeah, well done. Uh, and thank you very much. And thank you for any submissions that you send in. Hopefully that's all beautiful. Right. There we go. Kill that. I'm back. <clears throat> All righty. Um, what's next? What's the time? 8.41. We've got time for lots more questions. Uh, and a big g'day to um, Aaron. Thank you so much for your super chat. I can't show it. Um, I th You retracted the message. Uh, but, yeah, thank you for that. appreciate it. Okay. Let's have a look. Um, da -da -da -da. Next question is from... Uh, Paul says, um, hi, Gavin, just wondering uh, how the taste of farmhouse cheddar difference, difference differs from regular cheddar. Okay. So farmhouse cheddar or stirred curd cheddar, as it's better known as, um, you don't go through a cheddaring process. Okay. You just stir the curds until they're dry enough and then you can add flavours to them or whatever and then just press it, and bingo, boingo, you got a cheese that tastes similar to cheddar, to um, what's it called? West Country uh, Farmhouse Cheddar is the um, uh, DOP name, Designation of Origin Protection. Uh, that's the real name for cheddar, um, and that's the cloth banded style and all that sort of stuff. Regular cheddar, um, the curds dry out in the form of slabs. Now, you would have seen me doing that slab technique when I make cheddar or cheddar varieties. Uh, and that dries the curds out as well um, and gives it a slightly different texture. Uh, a, 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 when it matures over six months, textures more on the, not real crumbly, but um, on the firm and the, the oh, cheddar. Cheddar is so hard to describe it because it's such a, uh, prevalent cheese throughout the world it's the number one cheese in the world that people um that people eat um but yeah real matured proper matured cheddar it tastes absolutely amazing um and i would eat a farmhouse cheddar or stir curd cheddar a lot earlier it ripens a lot faster and earlier than what a stir uh, than a, a real um cheddared cheddar uh, it ripens at a different rate. So that, that's the two differences that I can see anyway from my experience of making both of them. Okay. Um, uh, Brug says, oh, no, that's not to me. That's to Ruth. Uh, Grado92 said, thanks for the videos. They are awesome. I tried the stirred curd cheese several times as well as the Manchego, Way Ricotta, Mozzarella, Borson Cottage, and Double Gloucester, and they have all been great. Thank you very much. I'm glad it all worked out for you. That's really good news. Um, uh, H7 Opolo says, what's the most cheese you've ever eaten in one sitting? Second ask attempt. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm very confused with the comments today. 
Uh, the most cheese. Oh. oh, there's this little cartoon. I don't know. I don't I haven't got it on me. It's a little picture of a rabbit eating cheese. Well, it's a person, rabbit, whatever, uh, eating cheese, and he and he gets to too much, and then he waits five minutes, and then keeps eating cheese. Um, I've never eaten a, a a big amount of cheese in one setting, and it's it's not good. <laughs> It's not good for your system. Kind of bungs you up. That's what they say about cheese. But um, yeah, look, everything in moderation. A little wedge of each flavoured cheese on a cheese platter. I put about four to five cheeses on a cheese platter, and between two and three people, we manage to polish that off. Usually, um, I wouldn't eat much more than that in one sitting. It's just you know everything in moderation. Okay. Um, Seth says, and I don't know who he's saying it to, but it says, cheese making is a skill that evolves. You have to keep trying and experimenting. Recipes are not gospel. Indeed, I agree. I change recipes all the time just to tweak them, uh, make them a little bit different, increase the volume of milk, increase the or increase or decrease the amount of culture I'm using, depending on the type of milk I'm using. So, yeah, recipes aren't in cement. So if you've got a good cheese making book, you know, like this one, which is very hard to get, by the way. And there's a super chat going off. Thank you for the super chat. Um, that's from Seth. Thank you, Seth. Um, yeah, if you, you know, you've got a book and you've got a recipe, all the books in this recipe, or the vast majority, um, ask for uh, 16 litres of milk. I haven't even got a pot that big. So I scale the recipes down for you guys uh, and make decent videos out of um, Patrick says, can you, can, Gavin, can you cheese be made from powdered milk? Look, I have seen a Franken cheese made from powdered milk on YouTube. I've never done it myself. The structure's just not there. It's not, you know, it's totally dehydrated. All of the whey um, or water that's in the milk has been extracted and it's been dried out. But no, it doesn't make it very good. You can't make a normal sort of cheese out of powdered milk you can make i've seen a, a a quick style mozzarella type thing um made with powdered milk but it's it's not the best um and yeah i said um thanks to seth didn't i ten dollars thank you mate very kind appreciate it um yeah the comments aren't working at all on restream now so i can't show up. i'm terribly sorry um, but I'll flash the curd nerd light automatically just for, that's me. Thank you for all the people who have done a super chat today. I really appreciate it. Okay. Um, question from Kristen says, I found cheese making is like making a pie crust. Practice makes perfect or close to it. Yeah. So, you know, it, there's so many variables with cheese making and, um, <clears throat> and I did buy a new book recently. Where is it? Here it is. I don't know if anybody's seen this before. It's from, um, I haven't got it online yet. I'm trying to find a cheap supplier. It's, co it's called Home Cheese Made, Homemade Cheese, Artisan Cheese Making Made Simple by Paul Thomas. Now, it's out of the UK. Um, uh, and, yeah, all the, uh, the recipes are in uh, metric and imperial, US imperial. Uh, and all of the cultures that he uses are either uh, Christian Hansen or CHR Hansen um, or um, uh, Denisco, which is uh, out of France. And he talks about units and stuff as far as um, amounts of cultures go. So it is a little bit tricky to try and determine the culture load that he talks about. But the good thing about the book is that he does talk about uh, using a pH meter a lot. Every recipe has the pH uh, setting or a pH recommendations for the type of cheese. And there's only 23 recipe, 23 or so recipes. How many? How to make 40 dairy products, including butter, cream, and yogurt. So they're not really cheeses, but yeah, there's not a, not a lot of cheese recipes in there you haven't seen on the channel before. But I'm interesting to have a look. Interested in looking at some of the recipes and the pH specifications he talks about. Anyway, um, so the next question is from 
I've got 10 minutes to go. It's from Aaron saying, I've used up all of my MO92 and MO30 I got from you. I can't find those in the States. What meso and thermo cultures would you recommend as some of the best cultures that are pretty universal? Uh, okay. So MO30, let me just bring up my culture chart. Um, can I find it in a flash? Uh, without too much trouble. Um, it's taking a little bit longer than I thought. Right, let's have a look. Uh, cultures. Right, so um, I'll share this. I don't know if anybody can see it. And share, Gav, share. So this little cultures guide that I got off of uh, Mary Carlin's artisan cheese making site. Uh, and what it does, can I make it bigger? Right, here we go. Yep, there we go. Bigger, bigger. It shows um, equivalents, roughly. So you can see that um, down here, we've got SACO, MO30. It uses um, Lactobacillus lactus subspecies lactus and Lactobacillus lactus subspecies cremoris. It has a supplier as well, but who knows? That's Glengarry Cheese Making Company in Canada but we stock it as well. But it tells you the different types, of notes and uses, whether it's a high or moderate acidifier with no gas production or whether it has any diacetyl production. Um, so you just look for the equivalent. So looking down an equivalent for MO30, LL and LC, very roughly would be the NISCO choose it, MA11, MA14, 16 or 19. They're all exactly the same culture, but it's phage, phage control. Don't have that issue with um, home cheese makers. Um, but yeah, choose it. MA11 is an equivalent. Uh, let's see, are there anything else? Uh, Aliba, uh, Abiasa type 3 is an equivalent. So, you know, this, like I said, this is available on Mary Carlin's cheese making, artisan cheese making website if it's still there. I got this a few years ago. As for MOT92, does it actually state, is there a SACO equivalent for thermophilic? No. Um, it's actually this one, I was saying, very similar to, oh, let me think. <clears throat> this one here, uh, Kazoo. So uh, MO92 that I use is very similar to Kazoo, which has LL, LC, LD, um, and LH. It actually has ST as well. So you'd have to add in, say, TA50. But anyway, yeah, you'd have to get something equivalent. But there's a list. Um, like I said, do I have a link? Um, just quickly, Gav, and see what I can come up with. Um, I'll stop sharing that so we don't get that black line. You get my beautiful face instead. Um, Mary, what's that? Uh, Mary Carlin. Okay, there it is. Uh, let's see if the website's there. Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, uh, Forms and charts. Hang on, I'll get the... I'll see if I can get the link. Will it give me a link? Uh, copy link address. All right, here we go, um, if it works. All right, so there's a link to the thing I just showed you there. Hopefully, it's come up on YouTube and, um, um, and uh, Facebook, and it says it has, but we'll see. Um, but, yeah, there you go. There's the link. To the pdf uh and yeah use it uh it's a great little tool um thank you jim jackson for being a member for 28 months as well i can't show that on the screen because it's not all working but uh thank you very much jim appreciate that uh we've got six minutes to go i'll see if i can pump out a few more questions um uh uh, do I have a video for Finnish uh, bread cheese? Uh, James, I don't, but I do have a recipe for it on little green cheese. Uh, let me just pull that up. Uh, little green cheese, that's my thing. 
Oh, come on, don't. Um, so just dragging that up now. And uh, let me just share that for you. So this is my um, repository of uh, stuff it's by me. Little Green Cheese, Cheese Making Home with Gavin Webber, the cheese man. Hey, that's me. I've actually revamped the front page and everything um, so it's easier to find stuff. You can see all these great interviews, podcast episodes, um, and cheese making recipes and stuff like that and supplies where you can get them. But anyway, there's a big search bar. I put that right at the top. So let's go on. Uh, coffee, cheese, does it come up with anything? No, of course not, Gav. That'd be too bloody easy. Uh, coffee, cheese. There we go. Right, so that's what the Swedish call it. So let me just bring up the, um, the link for you. So there is a recipe. I haven't tried it. Uh, homemade coffee, cheese, coffee. And let's bung that into the links. And there we go. All right, so that should come across in a second. You should get the link. Thank you so much for asking that question. I managed to find it for you. Uh, but, yeah, such great-looking cheeses um, that everybody had in the gallery. And Wendy's just said that. Such professional cheeses. I love seeing everybody's work. Thanks for showing us what we newbies can work towards. Um, I think a lot of those people too, Wendy, are newbies. Everybody's a newbie in cheese making, unless you know you've been doing it for fifty years or something. You learn something all the time. So there you go. Um, Patricia says Trentham. My sister lives there. What are the odds? Whew, crazy. I don't know. Um, uh, Bill says that is an excellent anniversary picture of the two of you. Yeah, they're great pictures. Kim put them up on her personal Facebook page, but. Um, I just copy them across there. Seth says, I have found that waxing a cheese too soon after its creation produces a product that is over moist. Indeed. That's why I always specify a period of air drying. Uh, make sure that it's touch dry. The cheese is, uh, that the surface is dry and it hasn't started to crack. Um, I find that two to three days, sometimes up to five days, is perfect so when there's no more moisture left on the outside of the cheese it's ready to wax or vacuum pack or whatever you do it before it's to your own detriment seth also said here's a question says i am experimenting by placing my cheese in the aging box for different durations before waxing in order to achieve the best desired texture thoughts gavin um, look, some cheeses they naturally age them on racks in big, uh, uh, in big um, cheese caves or you know fridges these days, uh, temperature controlled, and they just have them on pine boards, and that way the cheese dries out perfectly. It's exactly how it should be. So you're on the right track, I think, Seth. If you want to have naturally aged cheeses with you know the rind intact, so I think. Yeah, you're on the right track. Lucas says, do you have a recipe for oh, cockalek? I think that's how you say it. Um, no, I don't. Sorry. Um, oh, there's a sale. So <laughs> sorry about that. Um, at littlegreenworkshops.com. But yeah, um, thanks everybody for today's stream. It's time to go. Uh I have really appreciated everybody watching. I'm not sure how many people. I think it's about 80, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, and there will be a show again next week, and I promise that everything will work. can't believe it. I'm going to send in a complaint to Restream and tell them that their chitty chat didn't work from YouTube. Um, but don't forget that if you want to get any cheese-making supplies, don't, you can go over to littlegreenworkshops.com.au like somebody just did a second ago. Um, and you can get your cheese making supplies there. We ship to uh, uh, all over Australia, of course, New Zealand, Canada, um, United States, uh, where else? Norway, even. I sent one to Norway the other day because they're not part of the EU. EU and UK, I'm having issues with tax. 
So tell your regulators to pull their heads in. I can't. I can't. It's not profitable to set for me to send to the EU or United Kingdom, unfortunately. Um, and some Southeast Asia countries, um, which are close by to us, uh, they seem to be getting their parcels okay and customs aren't confiscating them. So, yeah, if you're in any of those places. Also, if you want to get any merch, uh, T-shirts, cups, all that sort of stuff, pop over to cheesemantv.creator-spring.com. Sorry, there's no better URL, but that's the merch store. But if you're on YouTube, there's a merch shelf down below. You can get all that good gear anyway. So very cool. Thanks, everybody, for um, your time. Oh, guess what? The YouTube stuff's actually working now. I can't believe it. Right at the end of the show, there we go. There's a YouTube comment. Little Green Workshops, that's where you get the stuff. Thanks, um, guys. Really appreciate it. Um, and. Uh, yeah, right at the end, David C. Glengarry Cheese Company is a great cheese shop to go to. Indeed. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Um, that's the way it goes. Yeah, indeed. And uh, we will see you uh, next week uh, on same channel, same time. And, uh, yeah, thanks. See you later. Bye.